Hi, I'm Alex Stenson. Um, I've been part of the Campus Ambassador Program uh, in the United States that was part of the Public Policy Initiative um, since its inception last August. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about experiences, um, about Campus Ambassadors and what it means to be a Campus Ambassador in relationship to Wikipedia. Um, and I'm gonna, I also uh, studied abroad in the UK for about six months and I helped develop the program there. Uh, so it's kind of a, I, I would like to diversify this role um, and kind of show you uh, the complexities that go behind the Campus Ambassador Program that may not be uh, being communicated to the community in general. Um, Sorry, I, I think you need the mic for you. Uh, is the guy that's recording back there. Okay. Is that better or worse? Or? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, um, the Campus Ambassador Program is a program that was first formed in the United States, part of the Public Policy Initiative. Um, and the Public Policy Initiative was a grant uh, was the product of a grant funded by the Stanton Foundation, and it was basically designed to pilot university outreach. Um, through Wikipedia teaching assignments in the United States. Um, and so what uh, the foundation asked professors was to assign two students to write about, um, uh, or have their students, assign the students to write Wikipedia articles on things they were researching in the classroom in the United States. Um, so it was initially designed as a teaching assignment program. Um, and what came out of that is a set of training that created campus ambassadors or in-person individuals to support these teaching assignments. Um, and these campus ambassadors came from all different lines of work. They could be volunteers that already did Wikimedia activities, or they could be people um, from the local campus community which were not necessarily involved in Wikimedia but really believed in the objectives of the project. So it could be students, uh, support faculty, et cetera. Um, and what's really interesting about this training then is that you're bringing Wikipedians, Wikimedians, and uh, individuals who have backgrounds in other places and may not understand Wikipedia, and you're teaching them how to facilitate teaching on Wikipedia. Um, so it, it's, it starts from the very basics of communicating uh, Wikipedia and coordination with the online community and um, uh, uh, basically communicating those ideas of the free knowledge, the communication um, that's so fundamental to the Wikimedia projects. Uh, so it, it's very much a taking individuals off the street and bringing them into the community in order to support uh, integration of students into the community. Um, and so it, when campus ambassadors showed up on campus, they did a lot of different things other than just the teaching assignments which the public policy initiative had uh, uh, been designed for. Of course, they supported the classes. They interacted with students and professors in the classroom, presenting about the basics of Wikipedia, how to edit Wikipedia, how to interact with the online community. Um, and this was really important. Uh, the, these campus ambassadors, um, I didn't mention it, were, are, were also paired with online ambassadors who were experienced Wikimedians that could help the students once the students got online. Uh, so it was a little bit more uh, complex. So you did have experienced Wikipedians working with all the students. However, the campus ambassadors, because they came from other places, um, Again, you had to integrate them into the community during the training. Um, and so they, they did support assignments, but what is more, they did, um, they interacted with the students and faculty in various different environments. Uh, the first and foremost be, of these being um, setting up uh, tables or uh, um, place, uh, presentations at conferences that talked about the Wikipedia Ambassador Program, Wikipedia in Higher Education, and kind of promoted and communicated the Wikimedia's movement idea in, in reflection of higher education um, it, it, to these academic communities. So it's really the ambassadors became the public face of Wikipedia um, in wor through workshops and uh, setting up tables and presenting and talking about Wikipedia in their academic communities. Um, in addition to that, they started doing something very innovative with students and uh, Cheryl who will be presenting uh, later in the day is uh, her uh, student club at the University of Michigan was really a, a model for um, how we create 
communities of individuals who were not necessarily invested with comedians. So like most meetups and communities in various areas are people that participated in the online community first and decided, oh, we're going to get offline and we're going to meet together and have social events. Um, and the campus ambassadors, some of them took this ability to communicate Wikipedia and the enthusiasm of the movement and moved it um, into the student realm. And they created a student club that engendered enthusiasm for both Wikipedia and for free culture and other things. And so Cheryl, uh, with her club, and there's a club at Imperial College London, and now and also one at James Madison University, what we've been able to do is we've been able to kind of create a training pool for both campus ambassadors and future Wikimedians um, it, it, through various events such as uh, um, trivia nights and uh, basic training and then explaining Wikipedia elements, as well as working with uh, directly with faculty and librarians to kind of develop relationships across campus for the Wikimedia movement. Um, so the campus ambassadors became this um, public face that, um, if you can't read this, it's, uh, the quote is, um, the age of nations is past, it remains for us now, if we do not wish to perish to set aside the ancient prejudices and build Wikipedia. Um, it, the campus ambassadors became this really vibrant community in some places became this really vibrant community um, promoting uh, uh, promoting Wikipedia and the idea of building the Wikimedia movement um, on their campus and throughout various areas because they and, and the question is what made them so successful I the, the, and from my perspective um, as someone that was both a Wikimedian before I became a campus ambassador and as someone that's done a lot of campus ambassador and stuff in the United States the thing that really shown was how the training helped make campus ambassadors better able to communicate the goals of the movement and become uh, the um, uh, better communicate the roles of the movement and become kind of a public face which people could interact with and see the community of Wikipedia. Um, and it, part of this was based on principles by which uh, the foundation staff kind of helped establish the Campus Ambassador Program. And the basic principles were be friendly, um, be enthusiastic about Wikipedia, uh, communicate, listen, advocate for new contributors, and really have fun. Um, and so on campus, when you, you have these trained campus ambassadors um, working with the university environment, you have a lot of very enthusiasm about Wikipedia in ways that are, it's unconventional um, when you just have the online community. Um, so in the US, we started with this pilot program that was kind of run by the foundation, and it, they did all the recruiting. And now we're moving this community towards a volunteer-led activity. Um, and part of this has been breaking the United States up into 10 regions, um, where we have activity in various campuses. And they, they look at like, very big different sizes, but it's based on the number of uh, campuses that we expect to be working with um, in this coming fall in each region. Uh, so each region has about five to eight classes. Oh, no. Uh, Richard, how many classes did we say? It's like three to eight classes per region, um, which uh, pr uh, volunteers, regional ambassadors, recruit uh, both professors to do teaching assignments and um, uh, campus ambassadors to support that. Now, it's, uh, it's part of the global education program, so it's still being kind of supported by the foundation. Um, but this is kind of the model of where this is going. It's based on the teaching assignment first. Let's find a campus ambassador. They bring the support. And then once the campus ambassador gets there, they start building in other ways. Um, what's happened at one university in Louisiana is that the u university itself has actually taken the campus ambassador program and absorbed it into another part of their teaching program. And so Wikipedia is institutionalized in the university and is basically paid for, like to do teaching assignments with Wikipedia is being paid for by that university. Um, so it's a very interesting dynamic and in advocacy for the Wikimedia movement and building Wikipedia. Um, now, um, 
I, uh, last January, I went to study abroad in the, uh, the UK for six months, and I had been participating in this campus ambassador program, and I immediately realized how this could be built into a more international program, and that's what the foundation staff had been talking about. Um, different communities around the globe a adapting this campus ambassador program for their area. And I really wanted to see what would happen if it was a volunteer-run program. Um, so when I went to the UK, I, I looked at the support infrastructure of the Wikimedia community already in the UK and said, um, we have an active chapter, we have a really active and well-organized community, and there's already uh, the rumblings of a student club starting at Imperial College London. Um, so when I went to the UK, I started talking to these communities, uh, finding out what academics were looking for and if teaching assignment model in the US would work. Um, in the UK, and what I found out was something very interesting. Um, both the, the uh, because this was a volunteer-led thing, I, I was relying kind of on the, what was uh, wanted from Wikimedia UK, what was wanted from the UK community, and I also was looking at what the UK university system would, would really work with, and I discovered that, in fact, if we just went with classroom teaching assignments where professors assign students to write articles on Wikipedia, that UK academic system doesn't like those types of projects. It doesn't readily adapt those types of projects um, with teach technology and whatnot into the classroom because of the way the curriculum is set up. So, um, and the volunteer community had always been really wanting to involve more students into their activities that already existed. Uh, so what I did is I started looking at the Imperial College London Club and, I'd, uh, and at the clubs we'd started in the United States and said, um, this is gonna be more of a volunteer-led, uh, not classroom, not teaching assignment-based campus ambassador program. Um, so when the UK adapted it, it became something much more um, focused on, what, you know, let's recruit students. And so, um, I, I, and like I mentioned, I had a little bit of difficulty amongst the community figuring out what the teaching assignments, how could we get enthusiasm for teaching assignments, both among the academics and the, uh, the, uh, the community. Um, the, the public policy initiative, as many of you probably have noticed, has really emphasized the teaching assignment in public policy, um, et cetera, et cetera in the United States, and it seems like the way the foundation was communicating this was be, um, very focused on these aspects. Uh, and so it was hard to communicate that the ambassador program was distinct and different and was going somewhere else. Um, and so that's part of the reason why I'm talking here and what really I had to work with in the UK. Um, also, and like I said, the British system is uh, designed, not designed for deploying big assignments with technology. Um, So I decided, uh, I helped the Imperial College London group really get their student club off the ground because I had watched my club and Cheryl's club form. Um, and this is what, I, uh, what happened in the UK. Um, I also started doing workshops in uh, uh, Wikipedia Academy at Imperial College to try to figure out what the, the academic community wanted, what would really make teaching assignments in a campus ambassador program work. Um, and what I found out is that if you had a support community, if you had a student club uh, working together at the university, it's much easier to lobby and get things through, such as a change in the curriculum to allow the teaching assignments. Um, so wh what happened is we trained a batch of ambassadors that weren't attached. In the US previously, we'd gone to find a uh, um, professor, train campus ambassador, uh, do teaching assignment. Here I decided, find campus ambassador, train them, build a community on campus, and then find teaching assignment. Um, and so we trained four campus ambassadors, uh, one of them's in the room, Derek, um, who were not directly attached to a teaching assignment and could build their community on their campus and explore what opportunities are there. Also, the UK chapter is now looking to go to freshers fairs or freshman fairs, uh, first year students um, fairs for uh, student activities on campus and set up tables to recruit more campus ambassadors and train them to build Wikimedia communities on each campus, which can then go forward and build the relationship between higher education on their campus and the Wikimedia community, which is already very active in the UK. Um, and so this is, uh, and the chapter is committed to funding this. So the volunteer community, which currently the chapter has no staff, 
Um, the public policy initiative had about five people devoted to it. The UK chapter has no staff, very strong volunteer community, a fair bit of money, and so they were able to take this campus ambassador concept and deploy it in a slightly different way um, than it had happened in the United, United Kingdom, and they're going forward with this. Um, and so, it, um, also, what was interesting is that some universities in the UK have very distinct academic systems, and one of them was Oxford, which has a tutorial system. Um, and I was actually at Oxford with my study abroad, so one of my tutors was like, let's assign you a Wikipedia article writing thing um, in the classroom. And it worked um, because it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the faculty who you're taking the class with. Um, so I did do a teaching assignment there, and the Oxford professor was actually, has a lot more flexibility on what they do in curriculum. Um, so this assignment really fits in there. Um, but that's the only person we have committed to doing teaching assignments. And we've also made some contacts through the US program of individuals that teach both in the US and the UK that want to do teaching assignments. Um, so the, the t both teaching and assignment aspect and the building community side aspect are, um, or something that the UK chapter is looking at going forward. Um, so I, I, I gave a lot of different uh, explanations of what actually happened. Um, but I, what's so important about what's happening um, with the ambassador program on these campuses? I think there's some major points to really bring out about this. When you train a campus ambassador, they get a chance to uh, learn how to explain the basics of the Wikimedia community and Wikipedia. Um, and that's what the training's about. Um, because when you go into a classroom, you have to ha think in a certain way to lead uh, beginners through really quick into things that most Wikipedians, Wikimedians, take several years to learn. Um, and so what happened is we have this compressed training and we have really good communicators about Wikipedia. So um, uh, misconceptions that show up commonly both in the academic community and amongst other individuals who we want to recruit to be part of the Campus Ambassador Program can be combated by the communication that's happening from the Wikipedia ambassadors, whether it's in a workshop, in the classroom, or somewhere else, and uh, really um, promote the concepts of the community and the ideas and that really makes Wikipedia vibrant and function. Um, uh, in one of the most memorable experiences, we did a survey of the ambassador program and ambassadors from all over the place is, um, the, that were working in the U.S. is the, the most memorable experiences were when were students or professors or individuals they were talking to outside of the class suddenly understood what Wikipedia meant. Um, and, and one of the big things I've been trying to communicate, and I think the ambassador program really makes effective, is the idea of community building and a community running behind Wikipedia. And it's really cool when people realize that there's more than just the information that's happening on Wikipedia. There's a community behind the information that's giving it to them. Um, so this kind of, uh, the campus ambassadors when they say, we have these teaching assignments where we can put you in the community, and also when they're discussing Wikipedia as a whole, um, really communicate this idea of uh, w Wikipedia as being something more, much more complex than that piece of information on, uh, uh, on the internet. And that creates a whole group of people talking about Wikipedia in new and different ways. Um, so you create Wikimedians from this communication uh, kind of, that advocate kind of for the, the concept that all the people who are experienced editors or contributors to the Wikimedia projects understand. Um, so that's what happens with these campus ambassadors. Also, um, it provides this, uh, this public face to the academic communities on the campuses. Um, these Wikipedia ambassadors, because usually we're used to interacting with Wikipedia online, and so you don't see the individuals that make it happen. When you have a campus ambassador on campus, all of a sudden, all the academics and the faculty and the librarians can come and ask that individual on the campus about Wikipedia. What does it mean? How do I use it? What's going to happen? Um, so this is a very, uh, it's it's very excited, uh, exciting for a lot of people to realize that Wikipedians are right there in front of them, working with them. And it's interesting because it's not our convention, like I said, it's not our conventional online contributor that's doing outreach. It's a combination of both individuals like the students who may have never participated in Wikimedia projects and the on uh, individuals that are from the online community. Um, so you have this more complex uh, interaction and relationship, and it's easier to see, oh, that's another student from the, uh, that's just like me, or another uh, faculty member that's just like the people I normally interact with, and they're Wikimedians too. 
Um, so that's a really important thing. Also, it, it harnesses the uh, enthusiasm of individuals who normally wouldn't gravitate towards the online community. So what I've found in recruiting campus ambassadors is that we have um, individuals that really support the movement, but don't realize how they can engage on the online community. They, they really like the idea of free knowledge, free communication, open uh, educational materials, open teaching, uh, ideas like that. And as soon as we present them with an opportunity, get trained to be involved in the community, they jump on it. Um, and it's really, really important. And uh, one of the communities that's very interesting to me to see show up is the number of females that want to be campus ambassadors. Um, and it, it's uh, whenever I send out groups of uh, uh, inquiries, group emails to people other than the Wikimedian community, I get a very high ratio of females, somewhere between 40 and 60 percent back um, in the applications. So that's a very even break, actually, which is almost revolutionary for the community. Um, so what happens is these women who like teaching, like Wikipedia, like the concepts, but may have been intimidated by the, the online community, suddenly have this venue which they can learn, be part of the online and the offline community. Um, so it's, it's really something that's important. Um, also, you get academics who, uh, who are very busy doing research and stuff and who support the movement. They can do the teaching assignments. Um, and teaching assignment doesn't take that much work when you provide someone who knows how to communicate Wikipedia. Um, it, it takes a little bit of rethinking how you do your curriculum, um, but it's not something that is too foreign to most professors who innovate in their teaching already. Um, so this allows to pull them in too, the people that are busy and would like to get involved in the online community but can't. Um, so it's a very interesting dynamic of individuals that we're pulling in. Um, and, and it's really important to say that this was happening both in the UK and the US. Two very different programs where the US is the foundation pushing forward something and providing a lot of staff, and the UK where it's me as a volunteer and the UK chapter as a volunteer, as a group of volunteers who are communicating this idea and p pushing it forward. Um, so it, it's something that's very important uh, to understand about the ambassador program. It's not just about the United States. It's not about public policy. It's not just about teaching assignments. It's about providing a group of individuals trained to communicate Wikimedia and Wikipedia in, on their campuses and innovate in new and different ways. Um, another element I didn't mention is when we, the campus ambassador program is very selective. Um, it, there is a selection process. You do turn in an application, at least as how it's been uh, happened in the U.S. and the U.K. So when you apply, am I close? Okay. Um, as you apply, you get screened for different elements. So a lot of individuals that show up and apply have quite extensive, uh, uh, or at least go through, make it through the application, have quite extensive <laughs> leadership capacity, speaking capacity, experience teaching. So what that does too is it involves very high energy, high um, performance individuals on the campuses that, are re uh, that really can help advocate for the movement. Um, so it's a, it's a slightly different community than we're used to when we go from the online community to off, uh, offline uh, outreach and activities. Um, and so uh, if you're interested in the ambassador program, I, I have links here. Um, the, they're both on the outreach wiki, and they're both easy to find if you click on the global education program or search um, Wikipedia ambassador program or for educators. Um, and on the Outreach Wiki, it's, they're, they're right there. It's outreach.wikimedia.org. Um, and this is, uh, these are some platforms where we've deployed information about both the program and the teaching assignments um, that are available. And it, the, everything's in English. Everything's designed for the English Wikipedia right now because uh, that's where the pilot was. But they're expanding the program in uh, India and Brazil where they're uh, hoping to diversify languages as well. Um, so it, if you uh, want to take this and move it somewhere else, it's, it works. Um, uh, the Poon, uh, Pune uh, um, pilot, uh, how many classes are? Almost 
Um, so this is very, very expansive, um, and it's going to work in multiple areas. And they're also starting to look in indigenous Indian languages as well as English. Um, so th this is something that volunteer communities or, uh, all over the world, um, whether through a chapter or through some other type of educational program, could really, really uh, embrace and move in a variety of different ways. Um, so, uh, ah. Um, there's my information. I'm user sat ads on English Wikipedia. I have a global uh, login, so I, I'm everywhere. Um, and that's my email and Twitter uh, um, tag. So uh, it, you can find me and contact me if you have any questions or you would like more information about the program. Please uh, welcome Laurie Phillips from Indianapolis. Thank you. Um, I need the clicker. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Lori Phillips, and I've served as the Wikipedian in residence at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis since last August. Um, and today I'll be attempting to define what e volunteer means for museums and Wikipedia. Um, if you want to be tweeting, also in addition to the Wikimania hashtag, you can do the GlamWiki hashtag. Be appreciated. Oh, there we go. So Liam Wyatt likes to declare to museums you have a volunteer program, but do you have an e volunteer program? After which she says, you do, you're just not affiliated with it yet. When a museum professional hears this, they'll likely ask, well, what is that? And how does it fit into our volunteer program? And we need to be able to answer the question, what is an e-volunteer? And also provide practical ways to get museums started. So when museums ask, where do we start? Our answer should be, work with what you have. Um, a partnership will be different for every museum because every museum has very different resources. Um, and in order to work with what they have, museums can first integrate Wikipedia into their existing programs and also integrate their resources into the Wikipedia community. And so we're going to be talking about each of these in turn in a second. Um, each of these images represent a cultural institution that have partnered with Wikipedia. They're all very different and have done very different projects. And they include the Palace of Versailles, the British Museum, um, my home at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, um, the Smithsonian Archives of American Art, and the Derby Museum is, rec um, is represented by the QRpedia code up here. And all of these Wikipedians that have worked with these museums are all here at Wikimania, so if you want to ask them about their individual projects, you can feel free to. So what museums know that they have are existing programs. And museums can use these programs to teach their participants how to contribute to Wikipedia. And when they do this, this will result in, firstly, their museum resources being shared. And also, um, a side effect is that participants will gain 21st century research skills. So really, it's a win-win. So what does this look like? My first example is the Children's Museum of Indianapolis' Museum Apprentice Program. And in this program, 33 teens between the ages of 13 and 18 um, worked in five teams to create Wikipedia articles um, about objects at the museum. They learned Wikipedia with the help of custom guides, and they created five articles within two months. In this case, we took the already existing Museum Apprentice Program, and we integrated Wikipedia into it to solve a need for the museum, that being to share their resources with Wikipedia. Um, and for the students, this resulted in um, an authentic learning opportunity. So that means that um, the research was not just handed in and forgotten, but it was shared globally and, as we say, made a difference. As one student said, this is definitely the most legit project that we've ever done. I really like that quote. Along those lines, they also did a meaning mapping activity. That's what this is up here, um, before the project and then again after. And um, in these, um, it showed that the students' perceptions about Wikipedia really did change. They provided a lot of um, detailed opinions. Oh, I'm like Sue. I'm being interrupted by the child. I like it. Um, <laughs> so um, they really provided a lot of detailed opinions about Wikipedia's reliability, ease of use, and its role in the classroom, which I found really interesting. Um, and some of my favorite quotes I just have to share. 
Wikipedia is not given as much credit as it should be. I still don't think teachers will give it due credit, but now I think I will give it more credit than before. And a personal favorite, this is what the internet was made for, to bring more knowledge. So these kids were getting it. <laughs> Oops. So for the museum, um, this project resulted in Wikipedia being used to, as a platform to share their research globally. Um, obviously, five new articles were created um, on everything from a dinosaur to a Dale Chihuly glass sculpture. And one, the historic Reuben Wells steam engine, which you may be able to see over here, um, made the Did You Know on the main page. And the Children's Museum is very different from most partnerships that tend to want to direct traffic from the Wikipedia article back to their museum site. Um, we do actually the opposite. We're really proud of the work that we've done in Wikipedia. So we um, use things like the Wikipedia widget, which is down here. It's on this left side of our uh, museum's website um, for the Reuben Wells. And this is a tool that we asked Magnus to develop for us um, that directs people from our website to more detailed information in Wikipedia. Um, also, we are continually adding QRpedia codes to our exhibits, um, which direct on-site visitors to articles we've created. This is really important in the Children's Museum because our labels have to be really short. So if people want to know more information about the object, they can now scan the QR code and learn everything there is to know about it. Um, and we've seen this work. <laughs> the, the dads do it a lot, actually. Um, <laughs> So you can also learn more about QRpedia in Roger's session tomorrow. So I'm not going to get into what that is because I'm not going to steal your thunder. <laughs> so my second um, example is the Indianapolis Museum of Arts um, e-volunteer program. And this program is integrated into their already existing volunteer program. You can see on their web, pa on their web page they have e-volunteering listed as one of their volunteering opportunities. And this goes straight to the Wiki Project page. And this uses guides and templates developed by Wiki Project Public Art, which Sarah will be talking about next, um, to teach museum volunteers how to create articles about IMA artworks. And this past year, conservation interns, who already do a lot of research, really in-depth research on artworks, use this model to share their published information, um, the published components of their research in Wikipedia. In the future, we want to use the docent training program, which does really intensive um, research projects on individual IMA artworks. And um, they'll use this model to share their research as well. And this can also just be a general e-volunteer program. All you have to do is remove the IMA from that URL. And it is a generalized guide that anyone can use in any museum. And also, this isn't just for teaching new Wikipedians. Um, any Wikipedian can come in and help a museum with their um, with researching their information. So we've talked about what museums know that they have. What they don't know that they have are Wikipedians as e-volunteers. So we need to show museums how to connect with this already existing community. And museums can do this by providing organized content in, um, that is easy to access and share in Wikipedia. So I have Sarah's archives up here organizing their content. And when you, when you add e-volunteers to that, you once again get the fact that you're sharing information on Wikipedia. But in this case, you're now connecting with the Wikipedia community. And these communities include, obviously, wiki projects. We all know those are topic-specific enthusiasts that um, you know, if the museum connects to the right community, they're going to be interested in what that museum has to offer. And also local Wikipedians. A lot of museums will not think about what local Wikipedians are around on, that can come on site. And um, they're going to perhaps already be loyal to the museum. Um, so backstage pass events have proven very successful in reaching out to Wikipedia, um, local Wikipedians. And these often include special collections tours that are nothing for the museum to do. They don't think twice about it. But for Wikipedians, it's really important to be able to get in and take images, take photos of objects that people wouldn't have been able to see. <laughs> Alex is back there smiling really big at me. I just noticed that. <laughs> um, and edit-a-thons, which can take place simultaneously on site and online, um, are really good at getting a lot of content up very quickly in a concentrated amount of time. So going back to the original question, how does an e-volunteer program fit into our volunteer program? Museums are going to have questions like, what are e-volunteers' motivations, skills, and needs? Um, what museum benefits should they receive? 
Um, Wikipedians might not want museum benefits, but museums want to give benefits to their volunteers and their e-volunteers. So we need to figure out how to fill that gap somehow. Um, and how can we track their involvement? Museums are interested in tracking hours for grant writing purposes. It's really important to them to track hours. Um, and they also want to reward volunteers for their help. So questions go into how much information are Wikipedians willing to give in order to receive benefits, and how can we come up with a more efficient way to track hours. Um, so this chart is just a very basic rundown. Um, I actually had it much more extensive, and I made it short, shorter for you guys. So it's less to read. Um, of um, comparing online and on-site volunteers, e-volunteers. And so just to quickly define both, online e-volunteers are going to be motivated more than likely to improve the um, encyclopedia. Um, they're obviously going to be familiar with the community, but they're not going to have access to the on-site resources, so they're going to need them digitized. Um, on-site e-volunteers are going to be motivated by their loyalty to the museum, and they'll have access to the on-site resources, but they're not going to be as familiar with um, Wikipedia. Now, um, backstage pass attendees and on-site um, um, attendees, on-site e edit-a-thon attendees, I'm sorry, they fall into both categories. They're kind of the best of both worlds because they obviously know the Wikipedia community and have access to the on-site resources. So, um, if you're going to be engaging with the museum, these are going to be the kind of questions they're going to have. Um, it's just a first basic step in defining, defining what e-volunteer is. We still have a lot of talk to get through what this is, but maybe this is a good um, frame of reference to get us started. And at the end, I'm happy to answer any questions or receive any more insight from you guys. So thanks so much. <laughs> do you want to hold yeah. and do your TED talk? Oh, yeah, I know. I talked. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. Five minutes extra. Oh, excellent. Thanks for the five minutes, Lori. <laughs> I could talk all day. <laughs> I had a, a problem with my PowerPoint, so I have to re-download my updated version. I'm terribly nervous, and it's weird because I, I have the pleasure of speaking publicly to a lot of people um, pretty frequently. And, um, oh, I'm Sarah. I'm Sarah Sturch, by the way. Um, I'm a uh, Wikipedian in residence at the Smithsonian Institution, and um, I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm very nervous presenting to you guys because you are really my colleagues. Um, I, I work in the museum industry primarily, and you guys actually know what I'll be talking about. Um, usually when I give these talks to museum people, they have no idea what I'm talking about, so I can just l lie to them and make up stories and data, but for you guys, I have to really deliver. So I'm shaky, which is so unlike me. I need a drink, I think. So we're gonna talk about um, Wiki Project Public Art. Um, there's my, uh, I have, I'll, I'll upload this, but that's my Twitter at the bottom, so you can all stalk me on the internet now. Um, so Wiki Project Public Art, this is our wonderful logo. Um, our mascot is the pigeon. So this little birdie loves public art. Um, our, our, I have notes here, sorry. Let me make sure I've got my stuff. Great, so um, our project formed in 2009 um, with Jenny McKaylee, who um, is a, a public art scholar at Alverno College in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Richard McCoy, who is an objects conservator at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Um, the two of them wanted to explore how they could use Wikipedia in their classroom, so this predates Campus Ambassadors, um, how they could utilize Wikipedia in their classroom to document public art in a collections management class for museum studies. So they proceeded to explore this opportunity utilizing the Smithsonian Institution, which is sort of our big federal museum in the United States, um, their Save Outdoor Sculpture program, which I'll talk about next. So the SAVE um, Outdoor Sculpture uh, Project was formed in the mid-1990s by the Smithsonian Archives, or pardon me, American Art Museum. And uh, this project utilized volunteers, specifically Girl Scouts, who have a badge that I think I've earned, um, uh, traveled throughout all 50 uh, states, and they documented public artwork. 
And this included artwork, primarily sculptures, um, hence the name Save Outdoor Sculptures, um, in graveyards, uh, shopping malls, you know, wherever public people, but where the people can easily access art that is free to view. So your sculpture gardens, etc. cetera. Um, their first project was working with Indiana University, hyphen Purdue University, um, Indianapolis, so IUPUI's uh, museum studies class. And these students took IUPUI's public art um, collection, which consists of 33 artworks um, on campus. And luckily, most of these have Save Outdoor Sculpture survey uh, documentation, which is online, and uh, wrote Wikipedia articles about all 33 of them and photographed them and uh, learned about conservation needs um, with all of these artworks. Um, this piece is a David Chihuly sculpture who is a Seattle-based glass artist. Um, he's pretty remarkable and a legend in the United States. Um, Lori mentioned him earlier. So, let's see. Oh, oh man, you just saw the best slide of all. This is a little slow, isn't it? Okay, let's hope it doesn't skip ahead. Um, I'm just using artwork to document this because the data might get a little boring um, at times. So this is a really uh, great work. Um, it's Mercury and his two muses, his two girlfriends. Um, what a lucky guy, right? So this is a piece from the early 1820s in downtown Indianapolis, um, Indiana. Um, and I don't think anybody knows it exists but me and the two Girl Scouts who surveyed it in the 1990s. Um, so I was not in the class that Jenny and Richard were in, or taught. Um, and in late 2009, I had graduated um, from IUPUI, and Richard and Jenny and Lori, who you met earlier, um, stalked me somehow and asked me to get involved in this project. And I was um, doing testing for Foursquare and Gowalla and just kind of playing with these geolocational um, applications to see how we could... Um, utilize them in regards to cultural objects, so sculptures. So they asked me to get involved, and um, I became addicted to public art. I call it the beast. Um, it, it pretty much, it, it, I'm obsessed with public art, and anyone who's traveled with me here, I'm sure there's a few people here, um, Wikipedians who have heard me point out public art on the streets of New York City and, and here in Haifa. Um, so our first big project was basically to make the most complete list of public art ever created about Indianapolis, Indiana's collections. Um, we built this list on Wikipedia, and it is pretty much the most complete list of public art documented on um, the website. Um, at least it has the most articles. So, this birdie loves to poop a lot. Um, poop means doo-doo, caca, shit. Um, I'm translating, obviously. Um, so, I, this is one of my favorite photos ever, I have to admit. Um, so, we've created a lot of articles, hence the poop uh, metaphor. Um, with those 50 museum studies students, they created 400 Wikipedia articles. 400 within like a year and a half. It's insane. Of course, they threatened to delete some of them, but we, we changed their minds, of course, with lots of fights and backup from the uh, Glam Wiki community. So in total, within about two years, we've produced a ton of articles. We've tagged 1,600 articles on Wikipedia that are related to public art, and uh, we've produced over 500 um, with students and with I think I've probably produced like 300 of those. So I swear I have a life. I really do. I have a life. Um, so this is a work called, oh, this thing. It's okay. Can I just do this? Um, this is a piece called Twisted House uh, located on the grounds of the Indianapolis Art Center. You can actually walk into it and there's a little table and you could have a cup of tea. And uh, it's really pretty bizarre. It's made by John Broughton, who you've probably never heard of but he has a Wikipedia article about this sculpture. Um, so what clarifies public art? That's usually the first question that people ask me. It can be pretty much anything that you consider aesthetically pleasing in the public sphere. We usually think of sculptures and monuments. Um, I like to write a lot about dead people, so I like to write about graveyards and grave sculptures. Um, murals, even performance art that takes place in the public place. 
So, in Indianapolis, back to Indy, our second project um, involved the Indiana State House. Um, they have about 40 public artworks inside and outside of the building. Um, so Richard McCoy, who I mentioned earlier, uh, worked with a group of students, again, to document this entire collection. They ended up creating articles for all of these objects, discovering information that even the State House didn't know about these artworks. So now they're updating their archives in regards to the content we have put on Wikipedia, which is very exciting. Um, this was such a notable project in Indianapolis that um, the state of Indiana actually rewarded the class, including Lori, um, a concurrent resolution, which is pretty much a, a pretty highly regarded award in uh, the United States, at least statewide um, government. So it was a very exciting project. This is one of the pieces on the grounds. Um, it says it's in memory of all Indiana workers who have died at work or in, as a result of their labor. Um, pretty intense Memorial Day sculpture. Again, that probably most people don't even know exists who drive by it every day. So Jenny McKaylee, who I mentioned earlier, is, um, was living in Indiana, and then she moved to Milwaukee, um, Wisconsin, to teach at Alverno, and she decided to, of course, utilize um, public art in her classroom as well. And they created a list of artwork in Milwaukee of over 100 works, uh, utilizing, again, the public art database from the Smithsonian and the Milwaukee Art Board, uh, Arts Board's uh, public art list. Um, this is a sculpture by Mark DeSuervo, uh, who Jenny actually writes about, um, called The Calling. It's a really phenomenal, large-scale work. Um, one of the really exciting things about this project, so they, there's 100 artworks, just over 100, in Milwaukee. The students have written 63 of the articles, and the Milwaukee Arts Board hired someone to work part-time to write Wikipedia articles about public art. Um, another really cool first step, I think. Um, soon everybody will be hiring Wikipedians. Is that good or bad? I don't know. That's for another talk, right? So now on to me. Um, I was recently called a narcissist on the Foundation L list um, by a troll, and I never denied that I'm not a narcissist. So all of, most of these pictures um, are ones I've taken. And, uh, this is Tony Smith. He's my favorite uh, U.S. sculptor, um, and I, I absolutely love his work. Uh, this is a piece at the Hirshhorn Museum in um, Washington, D.C. So... I often say that Wikipedia changed my life. Um, I'm sure a few of you in this room can maybe relate to that. Um, as dramatic as it sounds, it has, and this public art project pretty much brought me back to Wikipedia. Um, I edited for like five minutes in 2004 and hated it because people were jerks and I didn't know what I was doing. Classic stuff, right? And in 2006, I started to just kind of play around and I was doing like little janitorial tasks and you know the occasional minor edits. And then when Richard and Jenny and Lori came to me, I said, yeah, I know how to do some markup on Wikipedia, and okay. And public art was pretty much the catalyst for me now making Wikipedia my life, my thesis work. Um, that's why I'm here, is because of this project. I'll start crying. I get a little emotional. Ask the, uh, ask, ask <laughs> the uh, storytellers. Um, <laughs> you'll see me crying on Wikipedia in a few months, I'm sure, for your donations. Anyway... Um, so this, public passion, this passion for public art has really instilled this idea of how arts and art organizations can blend in with Wikipedia and open source technology. So I became addicted, as I mentioned, and I started to create lists about cities I've never even been to, um, lists of public artwork. I was using things like Google Maps to verify locations and traveling all over the country from my home on a cold winter's night, um, creating these lists. And there's plenty of red links if any of you want to write about them, of course. Um, so I um, accepted um, to get my, I decided to get my master's at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. in Museum Studies. And before I had moved to Washington, and I was still living in Indy, Indianapolis, I um, began creating a list of um, artworks in Washington, D.C. Um, and Washington, D.C. has over 700 public artworks, um, one of the biggest in the United States and possibly the world. Um, we have more equestrian statues than you'd know what to do with. Everyone rides a horse in Washington if they're, if they're made in, in bronze. Um, so I decided to make a list of these uh, artworks. And Washington, D.C., um, which you'll go to next year for Wikimania, right, um, 
is broken down into wards, so little sections of the city. Um, there's eight of them. And I took all 700 of these sculptures and did geolocation on them. I vis have visited the majority of them since I've moved and um, verified what ones still exist, what ones don't, photographed them, and I broke down my list. This is a piece by Guts on Borglum, by the way. It's called Raboni, and uh, it's one of my favorite sculptures at the Rock Creek Cemetery, and you can visit it next year. So I created this insane list. It took me six months to do, um, and you can click on the wards. It has the locations, the notable areas. Here's our map of the city. And um, it also includes murals, um, anything involving public art. It's my life work when it comes to public art. I'm very proud of it. So it, the really amazing thing about this project, well, and I forgot to notice, I'm sorry, or met note, um, with the DC project, I have had very few crowdsourcing successes as an individual Wikipedian when it comes to writing about public art. And I'll touch base on the successes we've had in a minute. But in my own luck, I, maybe it's because I'm a control freak, but I sort of took public art in DC as sort of my own thing. I'm very protective over it in the project. Somebody actually nominated this for deletion the day I, I finally put it in the, the public sphere, which I thought was amazing. I mean, who the hell would nominate it? They actually tried to delete our whole project. They wanted to delete the entire wiki project for public art, and all hell broke loose. If you can, you know, you know if some of you know how I am, so I was a little annoyed um, about this. Um, so, but the really cool thing is that myself and a couple other folks, and I mean literally like two other Wikipedians, have written um, over 300 articles um, about Washington D.C. public art, which is nuts, I think. <laughs> So some of the crowdsourcing successes we have had, um, this is a sculpture, it's a giant block of Indiana limestone um, located in Indianapolis, and it's about 700 tons, I swear to God, it's huge, and it's all these faces. So this sort of represents our crowdsourcing successes. Um, so we now have Wiki Public Art Project Task Force in Paris, Madison, Wisconsin, Adelaide, Australia, um, Hampton Roads, Virginia, which is just south of Washington, uh, London, Boston, uh, Venezuela, and as of last week, Baltimore, um, Maryland, and hopefully maybe more on the way. We have brought 58 new editors in two years to Wikipedia, and I'm not sure about retention. I'd like to find out, so please don't ask me. I haven't discovered all that, those details yet. And we have um, a current e-volunteer base of just over 90 active Wikipedians, which is pretty cool, and they actually edit. They don't just put their name on the list of the project like so many do, and produce nothing. We have active editors, yay! This is the Hauser Memorial. I think it's a little creepy. Um, it's her mother, a little girl and her mother reading a book um, in, another, in Rock Creek Cemetery, again in Washington, D.C. So to date, our project has uploaded over 1,500 images into Flickr, all CC by A. Um, a lot of our, our, our content, and since many I know here are copyright aware, um, are still uh, within the um, uh, copyright, uh, English in the United States, um, Freedom of Panorama, yada, yada, yada. Um, you, we can post images, like this, this is on Commons, because it's pre-1923, but the majority of our artworks are not able to be posted in Commons due to copyright law. So we upload them into Flickr, which allows users to then upload them onto Wikipedia as a fair use image. Um, but we've taken over 1,500 images, and it usually includes all three sides and the signature of the work. And um, again, because I'm a narcissist, I've probably taken about 500,000 million images of public art that are located on our actual uh, Wikipedia Saves Public Art, Flickr, and my own personal. So if you want a sculpture photograph, let me know. Um, the really cool thing about having these on Flickr, though, is that um, you know, there's that great crowd participation uh, aspect of Flickr, which Commons doesn't really have, um, which is a problem. So people have been able to help us identify artworks, which has been an incredibly powerful tool for us. And out of those 1,500 images, 95% of them are from Milwaukee, Washington, and Indianapolis. So this is Love, the famous Love sculpture. I'm sure many of you are familiar by Robert Indiana. Um, this is at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, quite possibly my favorite art museum in the world. Um, 
so through this project, just to wrap it up, um, we hope to bring awareness to the public about public art. I'd love to be able to see this project overflow into um, mobile capabilities with Wikipedia. Because you know when you have the little wiki app and you can do the geolocate and see what articles uh, are relate to where you're at. I'd love to be able to see this be easily utilized by Wikipedia um, in regards to art. And I, I th think one of the most compelling parts, aside from the awesome production we've had, we've had great success with this project, is that w people who are participating are falling in love with public art. I'm very emotional about my public art. I'm very sensitive about it. I want to see pieces conserved. I want to see pieces adopted and cared for. And this project has really helped bring that out in not only myself, but the students and the Wikipedians who participate. So thank you so very much. And uh, yeah, if you want to talk public art, let me know. Well, that's a really hard act to follow. Um, my name is Dr. Allison Kupiecki. I'm from the Israel Museum. And I'm the other side of GLAM. I'm the museum side. I'm the bad guy. I'm the curator side that everybody hates in this room. I don't know why, but that's the impression I get. <laughs> oh, okay, fine. There is a good side to those people, though. <laughs> um, so we decided after hearing the evangelist, Liam, Wyatt speak in Amsterdam six months ago. So we decided to try out a project um, which now falls under the auspices of GLAM. At that point, I didn't know that. Now I know more. Um, and so the museum, I'll just tell you a drop about the Israel Museum. The Israel Museum is the national museum um, in Israel. It's in Jerusalem. And on Sunday, if you all convince the bus driver to make a turn away from the old city towards the museum, you'll get to see it. Um, but uh, the museum has uh, a half a million objects, 24 departments, uh, from prehistory all the way to contemporary art, and it's um, bilingual. The, I'm the database manager, and all of our objects have a Hebrew English label, and so we're, we're, we're quite uh, digitized. So it seemed like a good place to start um, a project. So we chose uh, a very specific project, and I'll tell you more about it now. Um, of course, everybody, oh, I don't know how to use this. There it goes. Okay, so we're starting with artist files. What are artist files? Well, um, truthfully, before last year, I didn't know a lot about it either. So I'll, I'll tell you what I know now. In museums, archives, and libraries, there are files on artists. What does that mean? A file could include newspaper articles. It could include a video interview. It could include... Uh, a biographical information, a, a CV, you know, a resume, uh, maybe some pictures of artwork. It's, it's meant to give uh, context to the artwork that's in the museum, in most cases. In the Israel Museum, there's a unique uh, Israeli Art Information Center, which deals not just with the artists who have artwork in the museum, but all Israeli artists. It's quite global. There are 12,000 Israeli artists which have been monitored since 1975. Um, online, all of you can access 5,800 biographies in English and Hebrew about Israeli art. So we thought this would be a great project to start with. We have, and this is what I told Liam, I have 5,800 pages I can build in English and Hebrew tomorrow. Does that interest you? In Wikipedia. And he said, great. Well, well then he got me in touch with the Israel office um, for Wikipedia. There are human beings here that do this. This is quite impressive. And they came to the museum, and I introduced them to the curatorial staff, and they were very interested uh, to pursue the project, but they'd like to start smaller, like 50 artists, so that we could see that it really works. I said, okay, we could do that. So we're going to start with 50. Questions at the end, or? That's because they don't have an office, and they're all 
Right, right, right. Absolutely. Everyone's involved. I have to tell you that when you work in a museum, you're also a volunteer because the pay is atrocious. So it's all a work of love. I say it's all for fame and glory. I hope you all appreciate that. There. <laughs> well, I'm in good company. Anyway. <laughs> So online we have an information center uh, website which uh, explains a bit about each artist. It, it skipped along a little too fast. So the information center is a physical brick and mortar building. We have an office, we have files, we have real physical things. But since 2010, uh, it took an interesting change and we've become fully digitized. That means any new information coming into the center is either scanned or in most cases, it's received digital. So it could be invitations to gallery openings, it could be uh, resumes and images, all of it's coming to us now digitally, um, articles and newspapers, etc. cetera. So uh, our, um, what we tried to do is to make all this information accessible. Now there are issues of um, we're really third party, or your third party, we're the second party, but we can't pass on information that comes to us from other newspapers, for example. I can't post online all the articles that we are keeping. What I can do is I can give you the, the title of the article, I can tell you which newspaper to go to, but I can't put it online. Same with um, artwork that doesn't belong to our museum. So. For that reason, if you come to the center, there's still things you can see there that you can't see anywhere else. But specifically right now, we're dealing with 12,000 Israeli artists, 4,500 art pieces which are linked to those artists, 50,000 physical newspaper articles, 3,000 digital newspaper articles, 15,000 digitized exhibition invitations, 700 videos, and 2,500 reference publications. So that is in the information center. Now what of that can we put in on w w Wikipedia? Um, in addition to the uh, artist files, we have artwork in the museum. And um, what uh, we began to discuss with uh, Har El Kane from the Israeli well, chapter of uh, Wikipedia, what we decided to do is to focus on the artists, the 50 artists that are in the permanent gallery. So um, what you're looking at here is a view of the uh, one of three rooms on Israeli art. And uh, that focus specifically on Israeli art, but we also have Israeli art objects elsewhere in the museum. So this is one gallery, and in, on the side view of the gallery, whoops, go back, go back, go back. In this side view, there we go, can I go there? Yep, we have a little room that shows videos with interviews of artists. So, um, it'll take a minute to load, I see. But we've got, uh, most of the 50 artists have been interviewed. Um, some of them are still alive, some of them are not, but we have uh, information about the artist, I, no sounds, so you'll just take my word for it that there's a video and it talks. Um, the information that we have in the museum that is online, again, is focused throughout the museum galleries and um, we have small objects and quite large ones. So a large, um, whoo, went too far. I can't get this thing to do what I want, okay. So this is an exhibition which is right now in the museum, if you come, it's really lovely. It's Micha Ullman's retrospective, Sands of Time. And this is an installation which is bigger than me. So the artwork could be big and small. Um, so what's important to know about the Israel Museum in, in terms of Israeli art, we are encyclopedic, which means we have archeology, span we have Jew, Jewish art and life. We also have Israeli art, which is sprinkled throughout the galleries. So for example, we have, ooh, I hate that it keeps doing that. Fasten your seatbelts when you're watching Prezi, right? It's all <laughs> over the place. Um, so we have some artwork that's in the Oriental Room, some artwork that's in the photography department, some in prints and drawings, some in the sculpture garden, uh, design, uh, et cetera. Jump, jump, jump. Okay, I'm gonna use the buttons. I give up on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, on, no, not your fault, thank you for sharing. Um, so what we have online is uh, about 5,000, no, more, 8,000 um, items which are from the permanent galleries, not all are Israeli art, obviously. 
But this is uh, a very important piece from the museum. This is Yitzhak Danzinger's uh, Israeli uh, artist who was originally born in Germany, Nimrod, and it was done in 1939, and it's at the entrance to the gallery. Okay, we talked more about what it is we have, now what are we gonna do with it? So um, I, I, I've been very involved the last five years in European, uh, pan-European projects dealing with standards, how to standardize the schema, uh, multilingual vocabularies. Uh, I've represented the museum and Israel in a number of forums. Um, and this is a new field for me, artist files. So I figured, you know what, there must be a standard out there. And sure enough, there is. I googled artist files and I found that there's a wiki group <laughs> that deals with this is only in America. Um, artist files reveal documentation and access. It's under the auspices of the Art Library Society of North America. Well, I contacted them and they're real people. They're out there. The person who I was in touch with is in Getty. And they were very excited that we were interested in joining and uh, we are their first international institution. There are 300 institutions that have joined and uh, there we are on their website now. Okay, so what are our goals for the project? Now we've got a standard, we've got things that we want to share with Wikipedia, what, what are we gonna do with it? So we're starting with our website, which has data about every artist um, from 5,800, as I mentioned, that are online in English and Hebrew. We're gonna try to create, this is our long-term goal, create 5,800 Israeli artist pages in English and Hebrew. At the moment, currently in English, there are 113 of those online in Wikipedia, I did a check. And if they are online, then we'll uh, try and update the pages um, with information we have, or alternatively, put information into our database from the wiki pages so that we would be more concurrent with what's happening. And I really forgot to mention that, that we are very small staff. We have a staff of one, <laughs> and that's not me. We have a staff of one. Um, the information center, in general, the museum is very understaffed and relies heavily on volunteers, interns, and national service. Instead of going to the army in Israel, one of the options is you can work in a hospital, a school, or a museum and give of your year or two before beginning university studies. And so we've been very lucky in that respect and we have currently uh, 30 volunteers and uh, five interns and uh, three, three, well, really two. Two uh, national service boys and girls who are working with us on this project, but not just specifically this project. With all that said and done, we can't manage 12,000 artists. So what our goal is, and this is the important part where you come in, our goal is, is to open up the information which uh, we have, which is quite, I would call it basic and ask you to help us update it so that we can monitor Israeli art better. Well, if they're opening an exhibition in France for, you know, Seagal at Landau next week, so somebody of you would update her page and let us know, and that would have the community all interacting. And in addition, we would also like to, um, to translate this information. So we have an English and a Hebrew page. For those of you who read Hebrew, you can start there. But for the rest of you, you could start with the English side. And I've been walking through the halls and asking people, and all of you are invited to join, to translate to their native languages our first page, which was Larry Abramson. And I've got Ki Young, I don't know if he's here, who said he'll do Korean for me. And Josh from the Philippines said he'd do Tagalit. And we're working our way through the crowd. So anybody who wants to volunteer. Um, and so our project, what we're hoping, will be some kind of a, a community uh, uh, project, which all of you are involved in. And um, this is our English result, which uh, we, we put up last month for Larry Abramson's, and these are small steps to, towards a newly accessible future. So what's our timeline? How am I doing, five minutes? Okay, great, perfect. So we have begun as of July, we had our first meeting in the museum with the Israel Wikipedia staff and the curators. We are beginning our pilot this month and we've done our first artist, Larry Abramson, in four languages, yes. 
<laughs> so let me show you what we've done. So we've done our first um, entry. Our goal is by the end of October to have 10 artists in a few languages. So Larry Abramson in Hebrew, in this case, Larry Abramson in Hebrew existed. I have a feeling somebody, not in this room maybe, but somebody out there built the page and all we did was uh, connect to it. But um, very excited to show you our Russian version and we have our intern who's our Russian speaker here. Elizabeth, you wanna stand up? <laughs> so uh, we have a wonderful body of interns for the summer. Um, Elizabeth, whose native tongue is Russian, is from Harvard, and she's with us for the summer, but we also have two students from the art history department in Hong Kong City University, and we are now able to show you a page in Chinese for Larry Abramson, as of last week. I'm sure somebody in this room can find the mistake, and I'm waiting for someone to, <laughs> to find it. And we look forward to continuing this project for the next 50 for, um, from the permanent galleries till the end of December. And of course, following December, the rest is your, your work. You've got 5,800 to do. You get a bit busy. So we're looking towards, towards your help. Um, what goals do we have? Well, I've pretty much told you our goals and the benefits are clear. Our challenge is going to be to upkeep our own database at the pace that the wiki will be updated. Uh, we're very proud of the collaboration between all of our interns that come from all over the world. This summer we have this wonderful group. This is our backstage tour of the modern art uh, storage room that the girls, um, we have boys also, the truth is we have two boys this summer, but the girls and boys students came on. And we have a long-term community of interns. We've had, at this point, uh, close to 75 interns and national service people who've worked with us over the last six years. And staying in touch with them using our Facebook group page called I Digitize This Museum has been a lot of fun. And you're invited to come and see uh, our work and to stay in touch with us. So thank you very much. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take questions as a group. Any any questions? I do have the first question. Sure. I have the first question for uh, Alex about the campus ambassadors program. Okay. Uh, Wikipedians in usual sit in the houses and write from their computer, uh, and that's the, the their uh, volunteer. Um, how do you find volunteers? who go out and go to universities and speak to lectures and students. It's quite different volunteering wo uh, work to do. Uh, how do you find the... Um, well, we find the campus ambassadors mostly by kind of looking for people who have an interest in both either Wikipedia or education and technology or any combination of other things. So we send out mass emails to student groups. Um, we ask professors for recommendations. Uh, sometimes we'll put geo notices up on Wikipedia. So some people that have you know the small or medium sized contributions to Wikipedia will already be thinking about this stuff. Um, that's actually how they found me. Um, uh, well, we put up uh, contact information, and they contact us through Wikipedia, either through user emails or a uh, message on a talk page. Um, and sometimes, you know, and the rest of it's just kind of sending out massive emails to university groups and asking professors for recommendations of students. Uh, the best response we get is when professor recommends someone. Um, and it's usually either a student or a library or technology staff person at the... Um, at the campus, so. At the. Please, the one with the question, please arrive here because we can't uh, take the microphone. Come on forward. <laughs> Uh, still on the campus reps, uh, campus ambassadors program, I've seen a couple of ambassadors program come up in Kenya, but somewhere along the way they kind of die. So what do you guys uh, do to keep it uh, sustainable? Okay. Um, 
Well, the biggest thing I've noticed is that you need some kind of support infrastructure behind the ambassadors that can do logistics. Um, so in the US, we're using regional ambassadors to so, uh, like recruit professors and campus ambassadors and get them into trainings. Um, it, and that's being supported by um, one or two staff. Uh, it, it, and um, with the public policy initiative, uh, they were using a lot of staff. Now, in the UK, it's the other way around. They have a very active chapter that's mostly, it's all volunteers right now, and we'll soon have some staff that can do support for trainings. Um, so uh, we use like a committee structure um, in the, uh, of people interested in higher education in the ambassador program, and we kind of did logistics with that. I think the important thing, though, is um, where you have a strong chapter, uh, getting the, the some type of committee or something put together, but where the community is not very strong, like the US or India, um, it's going to be absolutely critical as it goes forward for someone to get some type of staff to provide extra support um, outside of, you know, because it, it's, it's really easy to ask volunteers to do recruiting and um, talking to people, but it's a lot harder to ask them to organize bringing people to a location for a training. Um, sometimes, especially if you have to move people from one location to another, uh, that requires a little bit of money and a little bit of uh, understanding of like hotels and airfare and all that. Um, and so it, it kind of is it's striking a balance between how much coordination the volunteers are doing and how much active participation, and re like recruitment and whatnot. Um, so it, and I think breaking it down into chunks, it really helps. So if you have like a, a lot, really strong program at one university, you get one person who has good leadership skills and they can kind of coordinate that. And um, it, it, what happens like at James Madison University where I'm at, um, I started it, I had kind of a bit of initiative. I started a student club, I did a little bit of recruiting. I found three or four students that were really interested in working with us. Um, I brought them in, I found two professors for them to work with in the spring, they did that. Um, and then uh, yeah, through those contacts, we've made more and more and more contacts. And uh, what we're looking at now is there's a professor who's really interested in making JMU responsible for the ambassador program. Um, so kind of, he because he realized how important it is for him to get involved, he, so it's finding those people that can coordinate and really, and breaking it into small chunks. So it's not just all one person doing one thing. And did you want to comment on that too? Oh, uh, you're asking a question? Yeah, I just want to comment and yeah. maybe ask a question also related to that. Uh, I was particularly interested in the online ambassador role as such. Uh, well, some sorry, some background. I'm, I'm Sri Kates from India, I'm part of the campus ambassador program in India. I'm uh, one of the fellows working with that program there. Um, the question that I wanted to ask was, uh, as far as online ambassadors are concerned in the US, while they were recruited, uh, there was there was some moderate. There was only a moderate amount of success with them, and uh, what I wanted to ask was, how successful were the ca the online ambassadors who were maybe located outside the United States, because there was some uh, dissonance with that. So I just wanted your view on that. Um, so a little bit of background on the um, on the online ambassadors. They're experienced Wikipedians. We recruited from the community that were used to community processes. Um, and who were, had a welcoming uh, interaction with new users before. And originally we had paired them one-on-one -on -one with students and going forward we're pairing a, a group of them with the professor. Um, so it's not, and the reason is because the students are only active every so often, whereas the class as a whole is active throughout. Um, so we don't want the online ambassadors uh, backing out. Um, the, and we actually had some Australian and New Zealand, uh, Australians and New Zealanders and people overseas like expat Americans and stuff um, participating in the online community on English. Um, and they were, a lot of them were fairly effective, especially if the students were good at communicating uh, with their ambassadors. And so we've kind of changed how we emphasize online communication. Um, so that's kind of something that's being developed and looked at. Um, and I, I'm not completely convinced that online ambassadors are necessary to doing Wikipedia article assignments all the time. Um, but I think it does help to have someone that you can call on if the community kind of jumps on something. And, uh, and it's also good to get feedback from the community. So maybe partnering with a wiki project or something might be a better route for certain classes. Um, does that answer? Yeah. Uh.
Next question. Okay. If I wanted to do something here in Israel and I wanted to teach the students, do you have, at those links, do you have programs? There are there PowerPoint programs or teaching programs? Uh, okay. Well, um, just for uh, those links, do have a lot of materials about the English Wikipedia and t uh, links to places. Um, also, if on the English Wikipedia, if you go Wikipedia colon ambassadors and then you go to the resources tab, there's even more stuff that it, we have all kinds of like. Uh, um, slideshows and uh, screencasts and sample assignments and a sample syllabus and all kinds of things. So it, it's really good resources. And my name is Denny. I we want. I'm from Israel. We want to build that kind of uh, program in Israel. And uh, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Uh, So a question to the public art project. Um, so I saw I saw quite a lot of uh, um, public statues and uh, sculptures and stuff like that. Um, what do you define as the boundaries of of the project? So so you did mention murals, but what about graffiti? What about um, kind of le less uh, institutional <laughs> public art? Yeah. Yeah. Usually public art, um, graffiti is always one of those topics that comes up. Um, I think my father was the first person to bring it up with me. That should be public art. Look at that crazy, beautiful graffiti. I said, Dad, not every graffiti artwork should have a, a page on Wikipedia, as we've learned. If you've ever d delved into the Wiki Project graffiti, which exists, um, I think it, oh, it depends, it's notability. I mean, honestly, if, you know, Shepard Ferry, um, some of you might know his work from the Obama Hope poster, um, started out as a street artist, um, and now he's a rock star, but I really think it just depends. It's, it's all about notability. You know, if that work of graffiti, like Banksy is a perfect example. I, I mean, I don't know if there's Banksy articles about specific pieces he's done or not, there are, I'm told there are a few. Um, if, say you have a graffiti artist who does this really awesome work down the street from your apartment, um, and the local papers start to write about how amazing it is, why not? It's the worst thing they're gonna do, nominate it for deletion. And then you tell your public art friends, and then we gang up on them. <laughs> and then tell them it's notable and should stay, no. But the, the best thing you could do is try. I mean, I don't really write about graffiti, but it's just because I haven't gotten to that point yet. So I focus on the low-hanging fruit. We, just, we also had the questions of um, religious artworks around churches. How oh, many yeah. angels in Indianapolis are we going to create? I've written like 50 articles about angels. Right. <laughs> so it, it's definitely a question that's come up that we've tried to define, but it's pretty much impossible yeah, to, I mean, like to one answer of, that. It is. It's, it's that, that gray line aspect. And one thing we also figured out is it might not deserve its own article, but perhaps it can fit into another article. So I don't know if that helps you out or, you know. Yes. This was mainly the DC community, so three of you. DC seems to be the only place so far where both Glam Wiki and Campus Ambassadors are deliberating. Do you see that these two programs are converging in any way? Let's get political. Um, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to even talk about it. Um, <laughs> So with yeah, Richard would be a good person to ask. Yeah, would be a good person to ask. Uh, he's uh, in New York, and he's kind of also the convergence of things. Um, I've been following both the Glam Wiki and the Campus Ambassador co co uh, conversations fairly closely, and I, for me, it seems that the Campus Ambassadors have a pretty clear role of working explicitly on the campus um, to facilitate education and outreach. Uh, where the glam people are more about working with institutions um, and building institutional awareness of Wikipedia and use of it. So like at a university, you could have a glam person who's a Wikipedian in residence that's working with the library and uh, um, in the, the local museum and stuff and doing... It, it is, it, I mean... Yeah. For five minutes, I, I know we have to end, but I just wanted to say that um, 
I've actually kind of been on both sides. So yeah. I was a teacher assistant for a class that did Glam Wiki articles, and they were grad students. So I wasn't a traditional public policy campus ambassador, but there are ways that um, actually tapping into graduate school programs are a really good way. Um, it's a great resource for Glam Wiki. Um, we always say we need a captive audience. Like, who are you going to get to make these articles? Who are we going to ever get to do it unless they're forced to for a grade? I mean, it's just, <laughs> that's kind of hard. Of, so there are a little army, and, and I've used that to my advantage quite a few times for Glam Wiki stuff. So. Yeah, Alex and I, um, I, I recently hosted the backstage pass at the Archives of American Art um, from the Smithsonian, and Alex attended, and... Um, our curator wants to do a project um, and a award a cash prize to a, this is a potential project, yeah. um, to uh, art, gradu art history graduate students um, for the best Wikipedia article about an art American artist. And it would be a first, I think, for Wikipedia yeah. to at least offer, you know, for a stuff for money. And so there's a where opportunities the, for crossover. Yeah, where the campus ambassadors would be, fit in, in there is they'd be providing the workshops and stuff on the campuses to support either if teachers decide to pick that up or if the, there's like groups of students on the campus. Whereas if, um, if the GLAM person's more working with the institution to m make sure that they understand what's going on and communicating with the campus people. Does that make sense? It, it, it's very there similar, but there's a big difference of what they're actually doing in the institution. We'll talk to you later if you have questions. Thank you very much for the lectures.